بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته In this evening by Allah's will we are going to be learning about the topic or the concept of the minor and major sins the minor and major sins in Islam followed by repentance and salvation and insha'Allah, we're going to learn some important concepts tonight. And I'll leave some time for you to ask any questions at the end, insha'Allah. So the topic once again for tonight by Allah's will is the concept of major and minor sins and the concept of salvation and repentance in Islam. I begin, my brothers and sisters, by saying the following. That every single one of us falls into sin. From the moment we are born, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places into us, even before we're born, the natural inclination of desire and temptation. And Allah created the angels, the humans, and the jinns, and the animals, as He has explained to us in the Qur'an. And we understand that the angels have an intellect but no desire. Therefore, they are not prone to sin. But they do have choice because the desires don't tempt them. The animals, they have only instinct and desire with a little bit of intellect but not enough. Therefore, they work by their instinct and however they feel. As for the humans and jinns, Allah created us in between. We have intellect and we have desires and temptation. And we're constantly wrestling between the two. So we all sin, my brothers and sisters. But we all also have the tendency of taqwa, which is to return to Allah, to place a barrier. What is taqwa? It means to place a barrier between you and Allah's punishment. Taqwa also means to avoid sins because you love Allah. And you honor Allah and respect Allah. Taqwa also mean, means the fear of losing Allah's connection and love. Taqwa also means to tread in your life carefully from the thorns that pave the way. And if you fall into a thorn, you cleanse yourself again and again and again until your soul leaves your body. And we can never understand this or appreciate it until we understand that we came from Allah. We have a purpose in this life. Everything in this life comes down to one thing. We have been created to worship and we are in a test at the moment. We're in an exam. Whether you like it or not. And we are returning back to Allah and Allah knows exactly what we're thinking. He knows our secrets and our public affairs and everything is written to detail. He will, he will hold us accountable, and He is fair and just, but He is also merciful and forgiving. And He is also punishing for those who deserve it. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in Surah Al-Shams, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Wa nafsi'u wa ma sawaha. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا By the nafs, by the way God has made you, and by the one who made you, the way He fashioned us, Allah says, He gave us the intellect to know right from wrong. He gave us the intellect from right from wrong, to know right from wrong. He who purifies themselves has succeeded, and he who obeys their desires has failed. It's as simple as that. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
also says in the Quran, وَلِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ لِيَجْزِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسَاءُوا بِمَا عَمِلُوا وَيَجْزِيَ الَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا بِالْحُسْنَى الَّذِينَ يَجْتَنِبُونَ كَبَائِرَ الْإِثْمِ وَالْفَوَاحِشَ إِلَّا اللَّمَمْ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ وَاسِعُ الْمَغْفِرَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Qamar To Allah alone belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. He will requite the evildoers for their deeds and bestow a goodly reward on those who have done good. On those who avoid grave sins and shameful deeds, even if they may sometimes stumble into lesser offences, surely your Lord is abounding in his forgiveness. My brothers and sisters, in this verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, that we all have the tendency to do righteousness or sin. And that Allah tells us, those who avoid the bigger sins which God had forbidden, the major sins, the big offenses, Allah will forgive the minor offenses that we do, automatically, without doing anything. Your Lord's forgiveness is wide. But you have to be careful, my brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made major sins and minor sins. The minor sins are forgiven if you can stay away from the major sins. This is the deal Allah gives us on one condition. And we're going to talk about it in detail. That we do not take the minor sins for granted. And think that this is a green card. For us to sin against Allah with the minor things which he has forbidden and to think that we are going to paradise because of it, feeling okay about it and not caring that Allah hath forbidden even minor sins. And the other condition is not to insist on continuing on particular minor sins while you know that you are doing it, insisting again and again and again and again and again. So let us delve into this and talk about it in detail, insha'Allah. Three men came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of them wanted to be a super, three of them wanted to be super Muslims. The first one said, I have vowed never to eat in the day, fast every single day. The second one says, I have vowed never to go to sleep. I'm going to pray all night for the rest of my life. The third one said, I have vowed never to get married. I'm going to practice celibacy and avoid all haram all my life. When the Prophet ﷺ heard about them, he said, The extremists are soon to destruction. The extremists destroy themselves three times. He said, I eat and I, dr- I, eat and I fast. I sleep and I pray and I marry women. Then he said, Prophet ﷺ said, بيده, By the one who possesses my soul in his hand. If you were not to sin, Allah would have perished you and wiped you all off the earth. And he would have, re, he would have created a new being who sin. And they will ask Allah to forgive them over and over again, turning to Him in repentance all the time. Ta'ala, فَيَغْفِرُ لَهُمْ And He will forgive them. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. My brothers and sisters, people should not misunderstand this hadith and take it in a way that will harm them. It is not a green light to say, I'm allowed to sin because of this hadith. The hadith is talking about two things. Number one, The extremism, where people think that they can live a life without any sin at all. That is impossible. In fact, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us with a tendency to sin? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name is a tawab, the one who who forgives, the one who loves, 
when his servant returns. Al-Ghafoor, the one who constantly forgives. Al-Rahim, how is his name going to be manifested if we don't sin and return to him and he is a tawab? That's who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And he loves to forgive. At the same time, at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, يستغفرون. They seek Allah's forgiveness. It's not just like that, which is go ahead, don't do major sins, pray my prayers, and continue in all my minor sins as if I'm living and strolling, loving life with doing all the sins so long as they're minor. Brothers and sisters, that's not the way. For if I love to do even minor sins, what am I thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is Allah to me? What does he mean to me? If you love your wife or you love your husband or you love your children, sometimes you want to do something, right? But if you love your parents or your children so much, you are ready to sacrifice and even things that are, you know, things that are not bad, you will avoid them or if you want, you know, whatever desires, whatever time you have, you'll give it up because of your love for these people. What about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave us everything that we have? And that is why the scholars used to say, do not look at the size of the sin, but look at, consider who you are sinning against, who you are disobeying. You're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحَقِّرَاتِ الذنوب. Beware of the insignificant sins. What does it mean, insignificant? Not that the sins are insignificant. Beware of you, what most people look at as whatever. Simple sins, they're just minor sins. For he said, those who take minor sins for granted... They're like this. It's like a group of people going into a valley and they want to light up a fire. So one person goes and gets a stick, one stick. Another person goes and gets another stick. And a third person, a fourth person, a fifth person. Let's say there's a hundred of them. And now suddenly you have a hundred sticks and you can light up a fire. Suddenly you have a fire. The minor sins are like these little sticks. You get a little bit of a one sin here, another sin there, another sin there, another sin there, another sin there. Not caring, not caring. We're not talking about people who, uh, we all sin every day. But they're the people who don't care. They take it for granted, they know what it is and they don't care. Sins after sins after sins, it's like that and then the fire is ignited. So my brothers and sisters, let us delve and talk about it inshallah. What is a sin in Islam? A sin is something which Allah has forbidden, either in the Qur'an or by his Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in an authentic hadith or both. It is forbidden, it's called an offense, it is the difference between right and wrong things. It's similar to illegal activity, doing a legal offense, disobeying the law, crossing a red light, all those but disobeying Allah's law. In Islam, there is no such concept as an original sin. This is a Christian concept, especially Catholics. They believe that because of our father Adam ate from the forbidden tree, that we inherited an original sin. And that is why we have the tendency to sin, they say. And that is why in some of the denominations they get baptized. Because when they get baptized, they say that it's an atonement, sacrament which gets rid of or prepares them again from the major original sin. They still have the tendency to sin, they say, but they've inherited this original sin. We Muslims and the Quran says no. Allah says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبَعَثَ رَسُولًا Allah says, no person will carry the burden and the sin of another person. And Allah says, we will never punish anyone until a messenger comes to them. You have to be warned first, you have to know, the, the path has to be cleared to you, 
and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold people accountable. In Islam, we also have three types of people who don't get sins. Number one, a person who is in asleep, literally in his sleep, and slept in. Whatever he or she says or does, let's say they accidentally slept past the salat, even though they had the intention to wake up, and they tried their best, but out of their control, there is no sin upon you while you are asleep. Number two, a person who is a child. A child until they reach puberty. There is no sin on a child. And number three, a person who has lost his mind or her mind, or has a mental, a, a real mental illness or disorder that is very clear that this person has no control over their actions. A majnoon, yani a person who has junoon, or a person who has gone unconscious, or a person who has lost memory or some kind of issue cognitively. These people, to various degrees, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who deserves sin and who doesn't. The Prophet ﷺ also said, Rufia an ummati al khata wa nasyan. From my ummah, from my nation, mistakes and forgetfulness has been lifted off them. The, the sin of mistake and forgetfulness has been lifted. If you genuinely forgot a duty that you had to do, you genuinely made a mistake, you assumed something genuinely, but then you found out that you had it wrong and it ended up being a sin, the pen is lifted off you. However, brothers and sisters, we cannot use ignorance as an excuse for everything. You and I may not know that something is a sin, and we're not going to know everything, of course. However, if we are not actively learning our deen, and we have given up, we don't want to learn, we don't want to read, we don't want to ask, and we're just living our life just for this life. No concern for the deen, for the person reaches 40, 50, 60, 70 years old and still doesn't know that there are five daily prayers, for example. Still doesn't know that pork is haram. Still doesn't know that uh, alcohol is haram, for example. Or that riba is haram. Or that fasting is a must. Or hajj is a must. This is not an acceptable ignorance. But if a person did not have the opportunity to learn because of circumstances, that's a different story. Things that the majority of people already know as Muslims, every Muslim has to know it. And if they didn't know, they must seek repentance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and learn it. Imam al-Shafi'i, if you know who he is, the great Imam al-Shafi'i says, ignorance, if we were to give an excuse for all the ignorance, then it would be better for people not to know, to stay ignorant, so that they don't feel the pain of sin and they don't regret, just live their life on, uh, what's it called? On uh, auto, autopilot. Better not to know. They say ignorance is bliss. No, we don't have that. We are, have a duty to learn. Of course, there are things that are too hard to know, like scholars know about them. We are exempt from that within our capacity, inshallah. Things like the five daily salat, like fasting Ramadan, zakat, hajj, the main forbidden things that everybody knows. We don't have an excuse to remain ignorant about them, brothers and sisters. The details is a different story. My brothers and sisters, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create sin? Allah created us with desires and temptations. So why make the sin upon us when He made us this way? Allah did not make us sinful, brothers and sisters. He gave us the tendency and He gave us the intellect and the power and the will to fight it. But we must be responsible for how we use our desires and temptations. Allah created desires and temptations which are the cause of our sins. But why? Because desires and temptations are needed for us in our life. They give us joy. They give us happiness. They allow us to live our lives in certain ways. For example, there's temptation and desire between a husband and wife. It encourages them to get married, to get closer, to be intimate with each other. There's desire for food. Allah SWT wants you to enjoy what He has given you. There's love for uh, you know, joking and entertainment so that we can use it with our children, with our friends to lighten up the mood and to help each other keep going in life. There's all these different desires and temptations and they're good. We need them. 
But we have to be responsible in how we use them because we can use them in the wrong way. A person can follow their desire to a point where they do where they murder, where they betray, where they rape, where they steal, where they cheat. That's not where the desire should be placed. The desire should be placed in the right place. Since Allah created desires and temptations, brothers and sisters, He told us to be responsible with how we use them. It necessitates that Allah says, don't use it this way, use it that way. I will reward you for using it in the right way, and I will hold you accountable if you use it in the wrong way. Allah says, Allah also pardons many things. Brothers and sisters, sins are a test of our truthfulness, our trust in Allah and our obedience to Him. They are to distinguish between those deserving of Allah's reward and those who are not. Sins are there, God said, forbidden things, haram things, to ward off harm from us, since humans are filled with desire and temptation, and to protect your rights and other people's rights. For example, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid intoxicants, alcohol and wine, intoxicants? Because of the major harm it causes to you and other people. And at the moment, if you just look it up, just Google it, any, any place, you will find that the number one cause in the world for the most crimes committed is alcohol. The number one cause for domestic violence in families is alcohol. And Allah says in the Quran, alcohol, intoxicants is the right name, and gambling, they have good in them in some ways, but their harm outweighs their good. What is the harm? Breaking families causing crime. And what's funny is that in a lot of the Western legal systems, a person, if they are drunk, they allow them to drink. They can get drunk. This is all right. There's no legal penalty. But if they commit a crime, they are accountable. It's an offense. Why allow it and then call it an offense? Whereas in Islam, both of them are an offense, drinking and committing. Since it forbids you from drinking in the first place even a drop, then you are responsible for the outcome of getting drunk as a result and committing crime. That's just one example. The example of sleeping around, zina, adultery, and fornication. In the 80s and 90s, there was a pa an epidemic of AIDS and HIV. The scientists got together after millions were wiped out. Tens, hundreds of millions were wiped out as a result of AIDS and HIV because people slept in a way that is haram, adultery and fornication. And when they discovered a way to treat HIV, till today we still have STDs and STIs rampant everywhere. Uncurable diseases still there. As an example, I'm just giving you a few examples. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forbid something unless it's harmful to you or to test you with it. And we have a soul, a mind and a body. And we are responsible for our soul, our mind, and our body. Every sin has a, a negative effect on our soul, a negative effect on our hearts, and a negative effect on our body and mind. Every sin, brothers and sisters. And every sin has an effect later on. You may not see the effect now, you can probably see the effect later. Years to come sometimes. Every sin has an effect. And we are indebted to our sins. However, the only way out is changing our ways, repentance, and some other ways which we're going to talk about, inshallah. My brothers and sisters, there are different types of sinners. There are the sinners who justify their sin. There are sinners who will argue with the Qur'an and will only accept the sins which they accept, which they want. As for the sins they cannot accept, they will argue with the Qur'an. This is disbelief in Allah. There is a difference between a person who is a servant to their sin, who has got a problem, and a person who tries to say, no, 
reinterpret the verses of the Qur'an according to his or her whims and desires. And a person who does their sin while admitting it's wrong. Both are still sins, but one is kufr, one is disbelief, one is major sin. There are sinners who do the sin but only feel regret for some of them, but don't feel regret for others. Some others, we got so used to them, it's a habit, and we no longer feel any of the flame inside our heart towards it. In fact, we enjoy it and we look forward to the next sin in the same way. Addictions and habits. Brothers and sisters, and there are those who do regret, but they can't leave it. And there are those who want to regret, but they can't regret. What do we do about them? We say, look for the cause. Some people, they sin and they don't regret. They can't feel it. But then when they hear a lecture or they hear a verse of the Qur'an or a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which moves the heart or a warning or hear about hellfire or judgment day or Allah, subhanAllah, suddenly they feel it. So what have I done? Who am I? What have I become? And this is not bad for you, brothers and sisters. It's not bad for your health. It is good for your health, inshallah. So long as your mindset is right, so long as you know what you need to do, what do you do about it? If you are sick, you go to the doctor. If you are in pain, you ask for the medicine. You get remedies, isn't that correct? If not one thing didn't work, you try another way, isn't that right? Same with sins. If this doesn't work, I try another way. I return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, having said all this, there are two types of sins, major sins and minor sins. What is the difference between the major and the minor? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also in Surah Al-Qamar, Allah says, if you can avoid the major sins of what we have forbidden, we will forgive your minor sins automatically and let you enter a generous, beautiful entrance into paradise. So therefore there's major and there is minor. What are they? The major and serious sins, brothers and sisters, the ulama, the scholars have classified them in the following way. They said, there are approximately 70 in number. Approximately. And they have different degrees of severity. Some are less, some are more. Not all of them apply to us. Some of them apply in the past, they don't apply now. But there are 13 that are mentioned by name in the Qur'an and Hadith. The rest of them... We know them by the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attaches a warning or a punishment to them in the Qur'an or in the Sunnah, in the Hadith. The 13 that are mentioned by name are the following. Associating partners with Allah. This is not only a major sin, but it's also disbelief in Allah. Associating partners with Allah. The second one that is mentioned by name, mistreatment and abuse of parents that is mentioned in the second degree. So our parents have a great right on, upon us. Number three, false witness, perjury. Where, by giving a false witness, you're going to cause harm for someone else. Lying as a witness. Number four, murder. Murdering. Number five, sorcery. Voodoo, magic, real magic that people do. Number six, consuming the wealth of orphans. I know it doesn't apply to most of us here, but those who are sponsoring orphans or foster orphans, donations come to the orphans, and what happens is they take it instead of using it for the orphans. This is something that's to be done in the past and some places today. Number seven, riba, usury. Consuming usury. Today the new name is called interest. Number, what number? Eight. This doesn't apply to us now, but this is in the case of the battlefield. 
when there is a charge, the Muslims have to charge for a person to leave and abandon their brothers and sisters during the charge. Number nine, accusing a chaste woman. Do you see, subhanAllah, in this hadith, a chaste woman is mentioned that we are, it is forbidden, is, a, is one of the big major sins to accuse her of committing adultery or fornication when she is known to be chaste, meaning she is not known to sleep with other men in a haram way. She's not known for wickedness, and a person accuses her is a major sin. The next one, a false oath. You say, Wallahi, on a lie. Wallahi, deliberately on a lie, is a major sin. Because using Allah's name. The next one, when a person curses or swears at their parents. This is mentioned different to the other one. The other one is more of an action and treatment. This one is more of verbal. Cursing a person's parents. And I warn you, brothers and sisters, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, there will come a time when people will swear at their own father. They said, how ya Rasulullah? He said, they will swear at other people's fathers. Then that person will swear at his father. It's as if he swore at his own father. So we don't involve parents. Number 12, killing a child, killing your own child. This is abortion. And in the past, they used to bury their children alive. Sometimes people have babies and they go and throw them in the bin or in the, on the streets and end up dying. This is a major sin, infanticide. And subhanAllah, one of the reasons in the modern world that leads to that is when people go around having sexual relationships, but they're not married. And so a lot of them are young, 14, 15, 16 years old. And they're not committed yet for marriage, but they can have a boyfriend and girlfriend and sleep around. Or sleep with one guy, it doesn't matter. When we say sleeping around, it's a multiple. All of that is forbidden in Islam. We see the result of it. Many of them in hospitals, and I've actually personally asked in different hospitals or when I've been there for different reasons, asked midwives, I've asked nurses about these things because I'm a teacher and I, know, I like to know what's going on in the world of the youth. They say a lot of 15s and 16s get abortions on a weekly basis because they can't be mothers yet. Obviously, they're very young. In my mind, I'm saying, subhanAllah, we forbid marriage. Marriage is forbidden by law. But to sleep with another guy and be pregnant and get an abortion is permissible by law. Whereas in Islam, it cuts the problem from its root. There is no sexual relationships before marriage. Next, the last one was zina bi zawjat al jar. This is a bit odd, but it used to happen a lot and probably does happen now in secret. Committing adultery or fornication with the wife of your neighbor. You're probably uh, a bit, bit odd for us. It happens a lot. Why? Because the neighbors are closest. And because your neighbors, a lot of people tend to trust each other too much, but there's a boundary in Islam. So these things happen a lot. Now, brothers and sisters, any major sin, any sin that Allah subhanahu wa talks about, or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and attaches a punishment or a warning or a curse or an anger, or if it has a punishment in Sharia law or has a punishment in the hereafter that is mentioned, know that this is a major sin. How do you know as a lay person, as a, as a commoner or a person who hasn't studied Sharia? Well, you've got to ask the people of knowledge. And the more you know, the more you abstain, insha'Allah. Here are some other examples which the scholars have enumerated about major sins. Each one of the ones I'm about to mention now, obviously they vary in degrees of severity. Some are worse than others. They all have an attachment of punishment or warning or anger from Allah or a curse attached to them. The first one, as I said before, is shirk which is making puns with Allah, murder. And I'm going to add a few more details here. Just some of, the, some of the more common ones. Suicide, abortion, serious injustice to others, zulm, serious injustice, not doing your obligatory acts of worship, 
For example, missing the five daily prayers is a major sin, brothers and sisters. Not fasting Ramadan or even one day is a major sin. Not paying your zakah is a major sin. Not covering in the way that Allah ordered us to cover. Men have a specific way of covering in front of uh, other people. And women have a specific way of covering in front of non-mahrams and other people. Hijab, the awra. It's a major sin to reveal them. Another one is adultery, fornication and homosexuality. Acting upon these three, doing them, is a major sin. Perjury and false witness in court or false witness when it means others will be harmed. We said this. Riba, which is user in interest. Gambling. Theft, extortion, serious blackmail. Deliberately avoiding paying a debt. A debt that you owe to someone that you're supposed to give back, according to Islam, is a major sin if you don't pay it deliberately and you were able to pay it. Not the person who is unable, but the person who is able, unless the person forgives you. Included in that debt, brothers and sisters, this applies to the brothers, the mahar, the bridal gift, or the way they call it, the dowry, or the dower of your wife, which you promised in the beginning of marriage. If you have not given that, and it's owed to her, and she requests it, and you refuse to give it, this is a major sin. It's a debt. Accusing a chaste woman, intoxicants, wine, alcohol, and recreational drugs which can intoxicate a person. Okay? Now, marijuana, and the likes of them, I don't think, according to some modern scholars, have reached the state, stage of major sin, because they don't intoxicate to take you out of the state of mind of thinking. They make you high a little bit, yes, but not out of the state of mind of thinking. They are minor sins. As for eating pork and non-halal meat, there is a difference of opinion among the scholars. Some say it's in the major category. Others, they say it's the minor. Doing it once is a minor sin. Doing it many times becomes a major sin. Another one is harmful backbiting. The scholars differed on whether backbiting is a major sin or minor sin. In general, if the backbiting involves accusation of another person, a slander, it's not true, or can cause serious harm to the person physically or their reputation or their family and property, then it is a major sin, that type of backbiting. The other type of backbiting is the one that is uh, very minor. Uh, it doesn't go beyond there. It doesn't cause any harm to the other person. That goes into a minor sin. So not all backbiting is major. However, there is a type of backbiting that is a major sin in all cases, and that's called the gossiper who incites or provokes conflict between people. That one is called namam or namima. Rasul Sallallahu once passed two graves. The hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. And, he, and he, the companions saw him get a plant. I don't know what kind of plant it was again. He split it into two and put one on each grave. This doesn't mean that we put plants. It was the Prophet ﷺ. He did this specifically for these two graves from the blessing of his hands. And he said, these two men in there are being punished. And they are not being punished for something that you consider big in your eyes, O oh people. The first one used to take for granted najasa. Najasa means impurities. He used to go to the toilet and doesn't care that the urine used to splash all over his clothes and go and pray with them and worship Allah with them, never cared about cleaning himself. Now, I don't want people to get into a paranoia from this. Some people, they get into obsessive compulsive disorder. Little bits that you are not aware of, it doesn't matter, inshallah. They are the people who deliberately and actively neglect themselves. That's why young people avoid urinals. And if you can, the sunnah is to sit and it's also healthy for you. Recent studies have shown this, that long-term it helps prevent certain uh, diseases, prostate cancer and so on, if you sit down, even for number one. So anyway, that's what happened. He said the second person used to walk around with namima. He used to go around gossiping to other people about things that would cause conflict and fights between people. That is a major sin, my brothers and sisters. And one more, deliberately praying in a state of junub. You know what junub is, right? 
An example of junub is when a person wakes up from bed with a wet dream and doesn't have a shower, knows that they are in that state and goes and prays. It's a major sin. You have to shower before it. Or married people, if you after intercourse, you don't shower and then you go and pray deliberately. This is also a major sin. So this is, these are some of the major sins. Let's go to the minor sins now, inshallah. What is a minor sin? We learned that a major sin are any sins which accompany a, a, a warning from Allah, a punishment, a curse, uh, an anger from Allah, a strong, stern warning. These are major sins. The minor sins, therefore, are all the rest that do not come with punishment or warnings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have said, avoid it. The Prophet ﷺ may have said, avoid it, but there's no stern warning. These are called minor sins. My brothers and sisters, what are the minor sins? For example, they are day-to-day -day minor sins that people do. And we all are prone to sin, as we said, such as, these are some of the ones that I've listed and done some research about them. Looking at forbidden things. So a person looks at the aura, nudity or nakedness, or a sexual image, looking at the aura. For example, if a man looks at another woman passing by in a way that is sexual, or someone who's not covered well and we deliberately look at them, or on the internet, or pornography, these looking at it once is a minor sin. Looking at it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and not caring, and finding... Uh, enjoyment again and looking forward to the next time and the next time and the next time. What do you think is going to happen, brothers and sisters? What happens to minor sins when we continue, 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 continue deliberately? It becomes a habit and a major sin. How do habits become? Ibn al-Qayyim says, everything starts with a thought. If you don't repel the thought, it turns into an idea. If you don't repel the idea, it turns into a plan. If you don't repel the plan, it turns into an action. If you repeat the action again and again, eventually it becomes a habit and then an addiction. There is a way, inshallah, out through repentance and reverse, inshallah ta'ala. But, khalik my habibi. We'll talk about repentance and how to deal with this soon. Number two, listening to forbidden things. Anything that's forbidden, such as listening to gossip, listening to swear words over and over again. So be careful with the rap music, brothers and sisters. Some scholars assume, some scholar, majority of scholars are of the opinion that music in general is haram. There is a minor, minority of scholars, past and present, who consider some music halal with conditions. We're not going to go into that, that. But either way, brothers and sisters, what is agreed upon is that it is a minor sin. And listening to gossip and all that stuff and haram words and things like that is a minor sin. So you've got to try and avoid it as much as you can. As much as you can. Touching or kissing the opposite gender, who are non-mahram, non-mahram, not your daughter or your wife or your mother or so on, non-mahrams. Kissing, hugging, touching. Some of the brothers, they say, they say to me sometimes, Ya Sheikh, with the student, Sir, Alhamdulillah, I have never committed adultery or fornication. So, I've done everything, sir, but wallah. When it came to the major one, I stopped. I'm strong, sir, I fear Allah. So, Habibi, sometimes the accumulation of repetition over and over and over and over can becomes worse than zina itself sometimes. Why? Because the effect can be worse. Some people I know have committed adultery and fornication. This is not to make it any lighter but committed adultery and fornication, and it caused them to repent to Allah and never return again and change their life. But when we take the small ones for granted, the shaitan, he comes to you and he knows, this guy is not going to go astray with alcohol. I can't bring the alcohol to him. Not with a woman to his doorstep or a man. I can't do that. I can't make them eat pork. I can't make them kill. But ah, I can make them feel like the minor sins are okay. And by the time they're dead... They would have gotten all these amazing minor sins and I'll be laughing. Brothers and sisters, be careful. So once or twice, you repent again, you pray your salat, you go back to it, you feel regret, you feel pain, you don't like doing it. That's a different story. We're going to talk about that in a minute. 
Being alone with the opposite gender in a secluded place, a man and a woman who are not mahrams to each other in a closed room is a minor sin. However, be careful of that. Minor sins lead to major sins. That's why they're called minor sins. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Any man or woman who seclude themselves alone, the shaitan is always their third. Always their third. Don't give me ifs, ands, and buts, brothers and sisters. Because we know as humans, one thing leads to another. Am I right or wrong? Honestly with ourselves. The only way out of it is to be honest with ourselves. And to stop. Don't even get there, inshallah. zina. Don't come close to zina. Lying. Lying, there's a difference of opinion among the scholars. Some say they're major sins, some say minor sin. Others, which is the middle ground, they say it depends on what kind of lying it is. If it's a lying which causes serious harm to other people, such as perjury, false witness, selling goods and cheating a person, selling them a, defa- a-, a faulty item for a big price, and so on, all of this is lying, this is major sin. As for lying, where it's day-to-day, like what we do sometimes, we call them white lie, sometimes a yellow lie, sometimes, but it's not harming anyone, they're minor sins. However, accumulation of this does develop a habit of a lying person. And a lying person who constantly lies in everything they say, yeah, and this type of a person, their heart will become dirtier as time goes, and eventually they will fall into bigger crime. My brothers and sisters, watching something, uh, watching, say, a movie or something like that, and inappropriate things popping up. These are minor sins. Swearing and cursing. So when I say cursing, as in the swear words at someone or saying things that hurt them is a minor sin. A jealousy and grudges are a minor sin unless you have a right to hold a grudge, unless you have a right. But in general, they're minor sins. Uh, false or unjustifiable anger. So carrying out, acting upon an anger that is unjustified. We are allowed to get angry. In fact, sometimes we must get angry and we get rewarded for it. When we get angry for the sake of Allah, but obviously there has to be wisdom in how we apply it. The anger that takes you out of your state of mind, you start throwing things around and saying things with not even paying attention is a minor sin. And if you cause harm to someone, it becomes a major sin if you cause, and sometimes it can cause murder, la samah Allah. So be careful of anger, try to... Calm it down. I'll give you a little hint of how to control anger, inshallah. It's just one little hint, inshallah. Brothers and sisters, did you know biologically, when you get angry, when you get angry, the reasoning process, thinking, is delayed literally by 10 seconds. How many seconds? 10. The thought process and the anger... They have a race. The anger comes out first, and literally within 10 seconds, your brain thinks. So if you are angry and you act upon the anger, you are delaying the thought process. You continue to get yourself angry, angry, angry. Each one is 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds. But if you can take from the moment you're angry, just wait 10 seconds somehow, just 10 seconds, you will find, subhanAllah, you start thinking. And when you start thinking, you control that anger and direct it in the right place. Just look at people with road rage, for example. As soon as they get angry, they act upon it within the first 10 seconds. That's why problems happen. But if you can wait 10 seconds, you find yourself calming down and you start thinking. This is a biological fact. You start thinking. Another reason why people get angry is because you feel your right has taken has been taken. Someone passed in front of you in the car. Take 10 seconds and then think, hold on a minute, I've done it to other people before. This person doesn't mean it, probably in a hurry, oh, just, just take it, it wasn't really personal. And suddenly your anger starts to calm down because he found a reason that, hold on a minute, it's not really personal. So there are, there, there's actually really good lessons on YouTube, you can find them inshallah, by some sheikhs and by experts who talk about how to control the anger. Number, the last ones is... Uh, Harming your neighbor with minor things. You know, what people do day to day, minor things with neighbor. Uh, Others are, for example, smoking cigarettes, smoking shisha, argila. 
Nargila, uh, that big thing that looks like a bong. <laughs> Shisha. Vape, vaping is a good one. All these are minor sins which accumulate and harm you, brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, urinating or going to the toilet to do number one, number two, while facing the qibla deliberately is a minor sin, for example. Uh, bringing impurities to the mosque is a minor sin. Yeah, and you know there's impurities on you and you enter the mosque with it deliberately is a minor sin. Praying in times which are disliked, such as when the sun is rising or setting, is a minor sin. It's not a major one. Uh, speaking when the imam is give, delivering the khutbah is a minor sin. Continuing to sell and buy when you know it's time for Jumu'ah, for example, and you don't go and you delay it is a minor sin. Uh, leading the salat, if you're going to pray imam, while you know the people don't want you to pray as imam. Odd, but it's there. Uh, when you know that your brother has proposed to a particular girl for marriage, proposed, and you go and you propose to her in secret as well, this is a minor sin and can probably cause a big fight. And uh, I remember one brother, he proposed to seven sisters at once. <laughs> Each one didn't know that he had proposed to the other one. So he's kind of seeing his options, right? Which one works out in the end? He'll just get rid of the other ones and go with the one that works. These sisters, they happen to communicate with each other. <laughs> I think social media had first come out. And one of them said, meet me here. The brother went to meet them. Guess what? All seven of them are waiting for him. <laughs> together. <laughs> you bring seven women together. Man, that's World War Three. The brother goes to me as soon as I saw them from a distance. They all looked at me. He goes, wallahi, I didn't enter. I just got in my car. I ran away and I traveled, went to my home country. <laughs> and I married someone there. <laughs> he ran away. <laughs> <laughs> he escaped the country, brothers and sisters. Who what? He'll say the shahada if you went in there. That's correct. So, brothers and sisters, this you can see why minor sins can cause... And it's not a minor sin for him to propose to several sisters. It's not a sin at all, actually. But, obviously, you've got to use your logic. It can cause you harm. But, anyway... Uh, Sometimes a sister may know two brothers came and proposed to her. She won't say about one but or the other and see which one's my options. This is minor sin, brothers and sisters. Uh, conflict a lot. You fight a lot with people. Verbal fighting a lot. This happens between husband and wife a lot or with your children and with you know, your, your, your friends. Fighting a lot all the time. Always fighting and arguing. These are minor sins that accumulate. Abandoning your Muslim brother or sister. Not talking to them. I don't want to talk to you. And then, you know, we're not talking for days and weeks. And you might think, well, Allah subhanahu wa doesn't accept their good deeds. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, but there's no punishment attached to it. And the good deeds, eventually, they're, on, they're put on hold. So on a day of judgment, Allah brings them and says, okay, what's going on? Come over here. What are we going to do with this? And He judges them. And eventually, the good deeds start getting distributed as they should. But it's a minor sin, not a major sin. And uh, brothers and sisters, there are many, many minor sins are many. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that we sin and He pardons us and He forgives us. So what is the way out, my dear brothers and sisters, finally? The way out, brothers and sisters, is not to confess your sin, number one. Don't go out confessing and thinking you have to tell people, you have to tell parents, you have to tell the imam so you can lift that guilt off you. You don't need to do that. In fact, it's probably a sin to go and expose your sin. And you probably give other people ideas They'll say, my God, this person who I always see in the masjid, all their life they've been doing these sins, and then you come and tell them, well, bro, you say, bro, I've been doing these sins, well, I feel bad about it. And then they might say to you, khalas, repent to Allah, brother. But you might give them ideas. Maybe they tell other people, maybe you tell a group of friends, they get ideas. Maybe they would have thought of you as mashallah, and then they find out, hold on a minute, this person's also a sinner like me, so they take it easy with their sins. Don't expose your sins. That's number one. Number two, brothers and sisters, we don't get baptized, I know that. But that's what Catholics do, get baptized. We don't, we don't need someone to do a ritual for us. So there's no rituals, whether it's baptism or anything else. How? There are two ways. 
The minor sins has one way, and the major sins has another way. Don't mix the two. Let's start with the minor sins. How do I get rid of my accumulated minor sins over the years? Very easy, brothers and sisters. Rasul Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, firstly in the Quran, وَاللَّهُ يُرِيدُ أَن يَتُوبَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَيُرِيدُ الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الشَّهَوَاتِ أَن تَمِيلُوا مَيْلًا عَظِيمًا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَن يُخَفِّفَ عَنكُمْ وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا Here is a beautiful positive hope. Allah says, Allah wants to forgive and wants you to return to Him and accept your repentance. But those who follow their desires and you accompany them, they want to turn you away from Allah and away from your right path, a great turning away. Allah wants to lessen your burden. He doesn't want harm on you. And man was created weak, meaning Allah knows we have desires. So Allah knows. He understands what you're going through. Some people regret, some people feel bad about their sin, they can't leave it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And He will assist you, but He wants you to come back. He wants you to do something. Just take a step and Allah will give you the next step. Take another step, Allah will come to you ten steps. Come walking to Him, Allah will come running to you. Just try it, my brothers and sisters. Wallahi, once you make that decision, you'll feel the willpower. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, وَتُوبُوا Repent, all of you believers, repent and return back to Allah, O honorable believers, so that you may reach success and salvation. So, my brothers and sisters, repentance and returning to Allah is the key. Minor sins. Allah says, If you avoid the major sins, I will forgive you your minor sins. That's one way. Don't do the major sins, you have a greater chance of your minor sins being automatically forgiven. Number two, Allah says, Allah says, perform your salah, your prayers, in the day and in the night. Verily, good deeds wipe away bad deeds. When you do good deeds, it wipes away your minor sins. So, here is a way, brothers and sisters. Never leave a minor sin unattended. Even if you spent the entire night looking at something you shouldn't be looking a thousand times, make sure, inshallah, you go and make wudu. The next day you do something, give sadaqah, you pray a couple of prayers, you do some good deeds and then regret what you've done. At least you have better chance for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your sin. And you'll keep that heart going. You'll keep that repentance going. There is a difference between somebody who does their minor sins and then gives up hope and says, I've got no hope. And then just keeps going on autopilot like that. Allahu Akbar. You are destroying yourself, brothers and sisters. Destroying yourself. Return. Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Say, O Muhammad, say O oh, to them on my behalf, O oh, my slaves, O oh, my servants, who have overburdened themselves with regret and pain because of their sins. Do not despair and give up hope from the mercy of Allah. Allah forgives all sins. Allah is the oft forgiver, most merciful. وَأَنِيبُوا Come back. وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَأَسْلِمُوا لَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمُ الْعَذَابُ ثُمَّ لَا تُنْصَرُونَ 
come close to Allah, Allah says. Come close with your good deeds. Come close with your worship. Come close to Allah. Even while you are dirty with sins, come close to Allah. Come close to Him. And submit yourself to Him. Tell Him, oh my Lord, I'm weak. I have a problem. My Lord, help me. I'm still there. It's been five years. Ya Rabb. Ya Rabb, when are you going to take this off me? Continue. Allah says, stay close to me and complain to me about your sins. Don't leave me. One day, inshallah, maybe one day it'll go. Before, Allah says, before a day comes when the punishment of your Lord will come and no one will save you. Don't leave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, this is the way to deal with minor sins. Always do good deeds. Your wudu takes away minor sins. Your fasting takes away minor sins. Sadaqa takes away minor sins. Saying a good word to your mother at home takes away minor sins. Saying a good word to your father. Looking after your children and being kind to them. Being merciful to a pet. Being merciful to an animal, subhanAllah. Being good to your neighbor. Saying assalamu alaikum to someone. Smiling is a sadaqa. Moving a harmful object from the street, even if it's something small, is a sadaqa. Restraining your anger takes away your minor sins. Forgiving someone takes away your minor sins. Subhanallah. From salat to salat forgives the minor sins in between. From jumu'ah to jumu'ah forgives the minor sins. From hajj to hajj, from umrah to umrah, from uh, Ramadan to Ramadan, fasting the day of Arafah, fasting the day of Muharram. All of these brothers and dua, saying astaghfirullah al-azim, saying la ilaha illallah, reciting the Qur'an. Mu'ad radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulallah, give me advice. He said, ittaqillaha haythu ma kunt. Fear Allah wherever you are. Wa atbi'i sayyi'at al-hasanata tamhuha. And follow up your bad deed with a good deed, it will wipe it away. Wa khaliqin nasa bi khuluqin hasan. And live on good terms with people. All of these brothers and sisters, wipe away the minor sins insha'Allah. So long as you continue them, they will wipe away and there is hope, insha'Allah ta'ala. Just don't take them for granted and say, Yalla, I'm okay, I'm going straight to paradise. Don't think like that. The whole idea is say to yourself, I, am, I, I know myself, I am sinful in ways and I ask Allah to forgive me. I'll continue my good deeds. My brothers and sisters, lastly, major sins. How do you get rid of major sins? Major sins, brothers and sisters, is only one way. No two ways. Major sins are only forgiven by Allah in one way. And there are four conditions. You've got to meet these four conditions. The first three are for everybody. And the fourth one is for specific cases. What are they? Number one, stop that major sin. Al-Iqla' stop it. How can someone repent to Allah and ask Him to forgive them when they still got the intention to do it tomorrow. If you ask Allah to forgive you for something and in the back of your mind you're intending tomorrow to do it or tonight, that's not repentance. If you repent to Allah and in your mind you're saying, mm, we'll see how it goes. Maybe, maybe not. You have not sincerely repented. So until that happens, you've done the first condition. Number two is regret. You've got to regret the sin. I said before, some people can't regret. They've been in it for so long and they say to themselves, I can't regret. We say to you, look for the cause. Recite Quran, learn from the Quran, go to a lecture, pick up something about the Day of Judgment on YouTube, listen to it, uh, go and sit with somebody who's knowledgeable and, and maybe and, you know, tell them, what can I do? Maybe they'll remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something like that, inshallah. Once you, you hear it in a Jum'ah khutbah, it hits you, inshallah. So don't abandon the masjids, don't abandon good religious friends, don't abandon these places, brothers and sisters, because they will remind you, inshallah. And lastly, make a commitment by asking Allah to forgive you. Make wudu, pray two rakahs, and lift your hands up and say, Oh Allah, forgive me. Forgive me, Ya Rabb, from my heart, and I promise you not to return to it. The fourth condition is if you owe someone a right that you have taken from them. The tawbah, the repentance, is not complete until you have returned what you took from them. If it's their reputation, try and make it up to them by asking them forgiveness or by going and trying to fix. And if you can't fix it, mend, do something good for them. Give sadaqah on their behalf, make dua for them, look after their children, go and ask for them, mend with them, do something that you can help them with. If it's something you stole, return it or pay them for it. If you cheated them in business, go and be honest with yourself. What did you cheat them with? Go and pay them back. Yes, brothers and sisters. If you sold them something that was faulty and you lied to them, go back to them, call them. I know a brother, 
when he was about, subhanAllah, 19 years old, he said to me, he was sitting in the car and he said to me, this was a long time ago, he said, you know, Wallah, I've been listening to many lectures, I've listened, listened to the Qur'an, I go to Rajumu'ah now, I pray at the masjid and Wallah, my heart has opened up, I repent to Allah and I'm changing my life. I said, Alhamdulillah, I hugged him and congratulated him. He said to me, there's one thing still on my mind. I said, what is it? He said, when I was 16, I stole a pair of jeans from some street here in, in Melbourne, from a shop. And I never returned the money or anything. I said, Tayyip, that's easy. Is the guy still there? He goes, the owner is still there. I checked. He goes, go and pay him for it. He said, what if he uh, you know, becomes nasty with me? I said, good. Wait until he closes his shop. Put the money in an envelope. How much was it? He said, it was this much. I said, put a little letter, anonymous, and whack it under the, under the, the door. Where there's a will, there's a way. You can fi find it out. And the shaitan won't be able to... The shaitan's... You know... You know <laughs> The shaitan is so weird, right? If he can't get you one way, he gets you another way, right? Um, so when, you, when the shaitan is around, you lose ideas. You don't know what to do anymore. He comes and tells you, man, you're stuffed. You're finished. you got no hope. Allah's going to punish you. Well, you think your salat is You're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. And these whispers come through your head. Here you are telling people you've stolen a pair of pants. Allah will never forgive you. You're going to hellfire. He'll probably even make you, somehow, someone will come and meet with you or on the internet and he'll push someone and whisper to them to write something terrible, say, you, you're a hypocrite, just to make you even feel worse. That's how the shaitan works. And then suddenly when you go and you say, I've repented to Allah, I will not listen, I will not let anybody affect me, the shaitan gives you ideas. He says, okay, okay, go, go here. Put an envelope under the door. <laughs> shaitan sometimes gives you ideas. Why? Because where you're heading after that could be even better than that. He, he weighs it out. He says, man, I'm better off with this small good deed than this big deed. Because where he's heading right now, he's going to become even better. He's probably going to go to Hajj. He's probably going to go and start reciting and memorizing the Quran. He's probably going to go and, no, 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 I'll just solve this for him so that, because some people, the sin that they have done could be a cause for them changing their life. And the shaitan doesn't like that. Did you know that, brothers and sisters? So anyway, let's say, for example, husband and wife, there could be big problems between them. Yeah, ikhwan, brothers and sisters, just because she's your wife, just because he's your husband, or they're your children, or that's your parents, or they're your brother and sister, make up with them, yeah, ikhwan, make it up, talk to them, constantly ask for forgiveness. Don't wait until you're on a deathbed and say, forgive me. Between husband and wife, it's good to ask them, forgive me. Nothing wrong with that, brothers and sisters. Unless you live with a toxic narcissist or something like that, alhamdulillah, what do you do? But try, try your best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what matters to you. Allah is what matters to you at the end. Brothers and sisters, divorces happen, for example, they want to get back at each other. They owe them something, they're not going to give it. They'll take them to court and go through kufr and go through all these things, right? To take what is not theirs. There's nothing wrong with you going to the court to get what is Islamically your right if the person doesn't give it to you. Or if somebody is harming and your only way is to use the court to protect yourself, you're allowed Islamically. But to go to get what is not yours... It's haram. Some people, they go to the sheikhs, they said, judge between us. And the sheikhs tell you, this is your right and this is your right. Sometimes either the man or the woman think, I didn't get enough. So what do they do? They go, oh, if I go with the law, I'll get more. So they go and take it out of zulm and perjury and lying. These are major sins, brothers and sisters. Let us repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the day comes when there is no more repentance. My brothers and sisters, last thing I want to say is this. Some people say to me, everything Allah forgives except for shirk. Allah says this, Allah forgives everything except for shirk. Shirk, brothers and sisters, is, is polytheism or making partners with Allah. I just want to correct that understanding. Allah on the day of judgment, when everybody has died and He raises you and everything's over, if you die with shirk, major shirk, that will no, not be forgiven. But everything else may be forgiven. Allah says, Inna Allah, la an bihi wa ma duna liman yasha. Allah will not forgive that you make partners with Him on the Day of Judgment, but He may forgive for whatever else He wills. But if you repent from shirk in this life, and you return and you renew your shahada and you say astaghfirullah al whether it's minor or major and you, if it's minor shirk you say astaghfirullah and I repent to you Allah if it's major shirk you astaghfirullah and say the shahada again 
Alhamdulillah, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives and He accepts the repentance more than a person who lost his camel in the middle of the desert and then sits there and thinks, I'm going to die. And then he puts himself to sleep on the, on the palm tree and says, I've given up, I'm just going to wait here until I'm dead because I've got no hope of survival or life. Then he wakes up and suddenly his camel is in front of him. How, Rasulullah said, how, how, uh, how joyful will he be? He gets so joyful that now he's going to have life that... He wants to thank Allah and then because he's so joyful, he loses his mind and he says accidentally, Oh God, you are my slave and I am your Lord. He says it the other way around. Allahumma anta abdi wa ana rabbuk. He's meant to say, Oh my Lord, you are truly my Lord and I am your slave. Because out of joy, he said it the other way. Rasul Sallallahu said, Allah is more joyful when his servant comes back to him after a long time than this man is joyful in that situation. He even said the words wrong. Subhanallah. And brothers and sisters, Allah accepts repentance and He will not judge your past when you have come back to Him. But brothers and sisters, return to Allah and the signs of your repentance is your regret and the signs of your repentance is that your iman rises. I in- conclude with this ayah. Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهِ إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Allah says, as a matter of fact, the true believers are those who when Allah's verses are recited upon them, their hearts begin to shiver and their bodies react and their iman rises more than what they felt it before and they truly put their trust and reliance upon Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardon us. Allahumma innaka afuun kareem. Tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anna. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, I've done it to you again. I made you sit down for a long time. And forgive me if you have any questions, inshaAllah. Okay, we have an announcement, inshaAllah. So, good news. We have a uh, Sheikh Abdul Ghani. Al-Baf, Sheikh Abdul Ghani Al-Baf, uh, who speaks English, of course, will be coming, uh, delivering a lecture at Preston Masjid entitled Safeguarding the Heart, beautiful topic, Safeguarding the Heart, on Saturday, this Saturday, inshallah, and what time is it? On the 8th of July, after, Mag- after Isha. On the 8th of July, this Saturday after Aisha. Jazakumullahu khair. Any questions before we leave, brothers and sisters? Hadran. Yes. Brother is asking from someone on the internet. Yeah. Oh, right. So there is a question. It says, between husband and wife, if one of them says to the other a lie, a lie, and says, Wallah, about the lie. Correct? And we all know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he said that there are three situations in which a lie is okay. One of them is when the husband says to his wife about her looks or her dress, and also some scholars said, or her cooking, that it's nice, but he doesn't really mean it. So it's like a a very minor lie which he is not accountable for because it brings them closer. So what if he said, Wallah, you look amazing. Well, what you can do with that, brothers and sisters, is you say, Wallah, and change your intention slightly. Why? Because originally that's a permissible way and it's the wrong way to call it lying. It's more of finding a way to keep the relationship making her feel beautiful about herself. So, for example, a person can say, Wallah, you look good. Well, good has many levels. Wallah, you look amazing. Meaning, to some people, you look amazing. To me, it's not amazing, but 
It's kind of amazing. So change your intention, inshallah. And I advise my brothers and sisters, especially husband and wife, don't drill each other with your wallah words. Because then you can probably carry sins yourself for putting the person on the spot. If it gets to the point where wallah becomes so precise, then obviously you can't lie anymore. You say, look, subhanallah, wallahi, you still look good, but not amazing, she says. Say, alhamdulillah, in my eyes, you'll always be amazing. So, you've got to work around it, unfortunately. This is the, the problems we have with spouses. Uh, one wife said to her husband, her husband said, you are the most beautiful girl in the world. And she says, why not the universe? Mushkila. Wallahi, Allah al-musta'an. Tfadda lakhi. Brother is asking, some people have done so many major sins in their lives and they cannot remember which major sins from what. And we said that repentance has to be specifically for each one on its own. That is correct. In this case, the scholars have already covered it, ya akhi, and alhamdulillah, it's easy. If a person cannot remember all the major sins, then in the past and they're gone, then they say, oh Allah, on behalf of all the major sins I've ever done, and I repent to you. But the thing is, if you don't remember the major sins, it means that you've stopped them. So alhamdulillah, you've already, that person, not you, that person has already done the first part. All they have to do is, Ya Rab, major sins which I cannot remember. Then that's the way to repent from them. But if a person's still doing them, they'll, they'll remember them. And you have to specifically say it from that, inshaAllah ta'ala. Now, uh, what if someone has sincerely repented from a major sin, later on they fell into it? Again. We say, insha'Allah, the tawbah was still valid. They do the tawbah again and again and again. So long as when they did their repentance, they didn't intend to do it again. So until it's really genuine, it'll go, insha'Allah. If they fall into it later on and they got weak, do the repentance again. Not a problem, insha'Allah. Don't leave yourself to keep going and going, insha'Allah. Now, yes, Bilal, how are you? Well, it's a tough question what you asked me. The brother is asking, what if, you don't, what, if you, what if there are differences of opinions about a sin, whether it's a sin or not? For example, the music that we mentioned before, and what, which madhab you follow, what do you do? First of all, I just want to say all the madhabs, akhi, all the schools of thought agree that music is haram, except in certain, certain instruments that you use in certain occasions. But some of the scholars outside of the madhab, which are reputable scholars like... Uh, uh, um, Ibn Hazm and modern day scholars I think like Qaradawi has written a book about it, Halal wal Haram some scholars have refuted it others they say, maybe but uh, what do you do in that case? well, as, as, as a lay person a person who hasn't got formal knowledge, not a, we call them student of knowledge, doesn't have the fundamentals really you can be what we call a muqallid. A muqallid means an imitator. You imitate the scholar that you trust most and which convinced you on condition that you don't follow it because of your desire. And each, each person knows themselves. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullah alayhi, says, sometimes a major sin can be decreased depending on how you approach it. So a, a major sin can become decreased for you if you're a person who finds yourself stuck with it and you regret it and you feel bad about it and you're trying to get out of it, that major sin can be decreased for you because of that. And for other people, a minor sin can be increased based on how they approach it. Some of them approach minor sins with arrogance and defiance to Allah, that becomes big. Same with following difference of opinion. A person may follow because of their whims and desires and others they follow because they're convinced.
from the alim, they trust them and they don't know any better, you can follow and be a muqallid. And subhanAllah, yani, uh, the minor sins of scholars who people imitate, their minor sins, a lot of them can be major sins because people imitate them. So the ulama, when they give a fatwa, they know that what they're doing is huge. Because if you do a minor sin and teach other people to do it, you accumulate also their minor sins. And that is why the alim has a tremendous responsibility before they write a book or they give a fatwa. As for you and, and other people, uh, and even for me, for some of the, the aspects which, which I'm, I'm not an expert in, I will seek scholars who are experts in that area to guide me and I can copy and imitate in certain areas. Each person at their own level. So long as they're qualified, known, reputable scholars, known for their knowledge, and people and other scholars have acknowledged them as scholars. All right. I hope that answers your question, inshallah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, brother is asking, if you've given a gift to someone and then you ask for the gift back, correct? Good. So there's a hadith about this, an authentic hadith. A person who gives a gift and then requests it back is like vomiting and then swallowing your vomit again, eating your vomit again. Now this is not a punishment or a warning or a threat or anything like that. It just shows you how ugly it is to do that. Therefore, it is a minor sin, number one. It's a minor sin to give a gift and then request it back. It's bad character. And obviously, you're going to see the consequence of it with people. They're going to look at you. You're going to be of a, of a lower level. Not you, Akhi, but in general. You won't be of a high-value person. They'll say, look at this guy. I'm never going to accept gifts from this guy. He just takes it back. And if you take it back, it is a minor sin. Does the person have to give it back? No. The person is not obliged to give it back. They can keep and tell you, you know, as we say in Arabic, Ruh ballat al bahar Go and tile the ocean. <laughs> Get out of here. But obviously we don't talk like that. My advice to people who request their gift back, if you can give it, give it to them and never accept the gift ever again and know your boundaries with this person. Does that answer your question? Barakallahu feek. Yes, good question. Brother over there is asking a very good question. And that is, we said that if you deliberately teach someone else to do a sin, they take it from you and then they end up doing it and sharing it with others and then other people now are doing this sin because of you. Yes, you will take a share of all their sins and they will take their own sins and whoever they taught. That is correct. It's the authentic hadith of Prophet Sallallahu then the brother is asking, what if you've repented and these people are continuing to do their sin? What's going to happen to you? Uh, then it's cut off, alhamdulillah. You get no more sins because you did a sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ma tawbatu ala ala, uh, 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 Inna ma tawbatu ala Allah Inna ma tawbatu ala Allah ala Allah bi jahalatin. Yes. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts it upon himself to accept your repentance for the people who did their sin out of ignorance, bad character, low iman, all of this is called jahala. So, when you did that, you had bad character, and once you repented and changed your ways, you no longer get the sins of the other people. If you can, go and tell these people, brothers, don't do that sin anymore. And they'll say, what a hypocrite, you're the one who told us, now you're suddenly a sheikh. Tell them, yes, I'm suddenly a sheikh, and thank you for that compliment. I wish I can be. Tell them, but honestly, I'm just going to advise you. I've stopped it. So, inshallah, uh, scholars talked about that extensively. Your sin is gone, inshallah. Otherwise, we're all doomed. What do we say about Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu? All those people that he whipped before Islam, and then he becomes a Muslim. Imagine him continuing to take the sins of people whom he stopped from Islam. What about the Sahabas who fought, in, uh, fought against the Muslims in Badr and Uhud and then later on converted to Islam? 
Huh? And they've killed so many companions. And they were shuhada. Khalid ibn al-Walid, how many Muslims did he kill of the Sahabas? Ah, so all these people who harmed, those who harmed the Prophet ﷺ and then repented and became Muslim, all of them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wiped away their sins. Whoever repents from a sin, it's as if they had no repentance, no sin. And Rasul ﷺ says, Regret is repentance. Regret is repentance. Subhanallah. So there are many avenues, brothers and sisters, that we can, inshallah, there's always hope. Now, um, look at me saying na'am, like I'm the great scholar sitting on it. You know how the great scholars, they say na'am. <laughs> anyway, brothers and sisters, any other questions? Yes, Habibi. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So, young brother there is asking... If somebody does a, what they call nasheed, good, good words that call people to deen, to Islam, to salat, all that stuff. And they make a nasheed that has music, musical instruments in it. Is it halal or haram? Right? Is that what you're asking? Tayyib. Again, we say this, brothers and sisters. The majority of scholars, classical scholars, have already stated that this is a sin. This is a minor sin. You shouldn't use musical instruments. Some of the scholars of the past have good argument about a daf, a one-tone drum, or a tabal, which is a drum that you can use. Minor sin. A minor amount of scholars, little amount of scholars, of the past and present, consider that allowed, mubah which means neutral. So long as it reminds people of Allah, it brings them back to the deen, it teaches them and educates them something that is good, then accompanying some musical instruments with it is permissible, they said, some scholars, not, not all of them. So, as I said to the young brother over there, if you don't know any better, you can follow the scholar which you uh, trust, and convinces you, insha'Allah ta'ala. I'm not going to give you a fatwa here. I'm not a mufti. But there is a difference of opinion. And so long as there is difference of opinion among it, there's some leeway, even a little bit. But really, brothers and sisters, if I told you musical music's halal, and I went to you and said, go ahead, you know what happens, especially young people, this is what happens. You don't go and listen to Mozart and to opera. What do young people listen to? If I said, music's halal, what are they going to do? Let's, let's talk practically. Let's talk realistically. Let's say I said, music is halal, there's no difference of opinion. What, what are we going to listen to? What, what do young people listen to? What are they going to go for? 50 cents? It's old. It's advanced, Habib. Music keeps advancing and getting more and more weirder and more daring. Right? Pop music of all sorts, the rap music that's out there, and some of them they justify, they go, rap music, it's political, it teaches you to be strong. La ya habibi, la la. Rap music teaches you bad character and rebellion. Some of it has nice words in it, but the, the, the environment of it, when you watch them on stage, the way they dress, the way they talk, the way they are, the mannerism that they have, uh, the way they interact, the environment on, in their concerts, all of that has something to do with their music, brothers and sisters. Yeah, and it has an effect. SubhanAllah, the other day I saw on social media, there is a non-Muslim lady, non-Muslim. She has nothing, no, doesn't know anything about Islam. And she says, I stopped listening to music because she says it affected me in a way that manipulates my thought process and makes me believe who, something I'm not. And it made me more depressed the more I listened. So SubhanAllah, I was very intrigued by that. I, I, I saved it, and then two days later, it was taken down for some reason. <laughs> well, it's taken down, no video left. But it made sense from a, from a psychological perspective that it has an effect. Now, if it's haram, it's a minor sin. It's a minor sin. And, you know, if it's bad words, it becomes worse. And if you attend the concert, it becomes worse, and so on. I mean, when was the last time somebody listened to pop music and thought, bro... Wallah, after listening to this music, I want to repent to Allah. I want to go to the masjid now. Wallah, bro, I missed the masjid. 
You don't hear that. This is what I hear. I hear, I visited a brother the other day who had a major car accident. Subhanallah. And uh, without describing, the injuries were pretty horrific. However, alhamdulillah, he is healing, alhamdulillah. And the first thing he said to me, we were driving, we we'll listen to music. And although music is a minor sin, the brother, because he faced death, the way he looked at it was, I don't want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that being the last things I do. Right? So, I mean, I, I admit, back in my days, I used to listen to music, and I used to listen to Quran. He's shocked. Habibi, I was born in Australia. I listened to music. I was in grade four. But I kept going till I was about, you know, 16, 17. But I was in grade four one time, and I remember this group of students coming to me and saying, they gave me a paper with all these lyrics on it. And they said, are you in or out? I said, oh, in sounds better. I go, I'm in. And they go, all right, by tonight you've got to memorize Michael Jackson's lyrics. You know I'm bad, I'm bad. So I went and memorized them all because I've got to be in, man. I can't be out. I don't know what that means. Next day I came and memorized the whole thing. I think I had either Shamsu Kuwirat that was owing to my teacher. I went and memorized, you know I'm bad, you know I'm bad, and the whole world has to end, you know I'm bad. Michael Jackson's song that time. And suddenly they go to me, you're in, you're part of the gang. <laughs> what gang is it? I don't know what it is. But the point is, uh, we all fell into it and there came a time, and I can tell you, music moves you, man. Well, it moves you, even till now. You, sometimes I'll be walking in the, I have to admit, I'll be walking in the market, a, a song from the past comes up, it does something to me. I, I get memories. Because music, it attaches you to memories. That's why you like it. It's very personal. But it's a lie. And it's very temporary. And it mimics. And it lasts for three or four minutes. And then after that, what? You want to listen again and again. And then finally, what? You get tired of it. You want something else. What's happening to you? It's drugging you. You know, um, the most truthful words are the Qur'an. And until we immerse ourselves into it, we were never going to taste the beauty and the sweetness of what Iman really is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. But anyway, brothers and sisters, if you are a person who listens to music and you're doing this minor sin, my advice to you, brothers, is this, and sisters, when you listen to music that time, make sure you also listen to the Qur'an after it. For the same time or more. You listen to 10 minutes, go and listen 20 minutes Qur'an. Go and make wudu. Go and help your mother, your father. Go and do, do uh, two rakahs of salat. Go and say la ilaha illallah a hundred times. Follow it up with good deeds, brothers and sisters. No matter what it is, just continue to do good deeds, inshallah. Good deeds wipe away bad deeds. The shaitan will get confused, yeah. The more you do salat, the shaitan will say, okay, okay, music is bad for you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Subhanallah. So, brothers and sisters, here's the thing. Always follow up good deeds with bad. And if you die with, with sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafoorul rahim, is most forgiving, most merciful. There are some people who, on the day of judgment, because of what they did for their parents, and they did the compulsory acts and stayed away from major sins, Allah just wipes away all their minor sins altogether. So, don't take for granted good deeds. Even taking an object off the street is a sadaqah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards for a one good deed up to 10 folds, up to 70 folds, and more for anyone. But one sin is equal to only one. One bad deed is only equal to one sin. And a good deed is equal to 10 to 70. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us. Last question. A friend in need is a friend indeed. What's the question? I don't. I, yeah, okay, so let's repeat. Let's repeat it and work with you. Sorry, brother. So you have a friend, a good best friend, a good close friend. He was in need for you, and you weren't able to help him. And then, and now you feel bad that you weren't able, or you didn't. You just didn't help him. Just unable to help, and you feel bad. And then what? And then you lose your friend. Oh, that's not really a friend. You said he's a good friend. A good friend, Akhi, 
is a person who gives you excuses and understands. I've got really good friends. And when I say to them, Brother Wallahi, I feel bad, I wasn't able to help, forgive me, they immediately forgive me, no matter what it was. That's a good friend. So I don't know, that kind of friend who doesn't forgive because knowing that you had circumstances, I don't know, may Allah subhanahu wa forgive him. Allah says in the Quran, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not ask or put a responsibility or a duty upon a person beyond their means and their ability. So how can we not have mercy with each other? No, they have no right to be upset with you. May Allah forgive them. Tabla lahi. So a child asks their parents for f a child. A child, brother, sorry, I didn't hear you that well. Can I repeat it? So a child went and asked for forgiveness on behalf of their parents from someone else. All right. Yes, of course it's valid. Not a problem. Beautiful. And may Allah reward that righteous child for doing something like that. Now, if their own parents didn't know about it, inshallah, it's still forgiven. However, if the parents themselves have a problem with the other person, how are they going to be judged for that? Allahu alam. But definitely, akhi. And if, for example, a parent could pass away and we go around asking people whom they have wronged to forgive them, of course we can. Definitely, Allah is merciful beyond our dreams, ya akhi. And even on the Day of Judgment, there is a place called Al-Qantara. Have you heard of that? On the Sirat, the bridge that's bestowed above Hellfire, there is a hill called Qantara. What happens at that Qantara? Rasul said, the believers are stationed and held back there. They don't go forward and they don't go backwards. These believers, they're the ones who passed everything, but there are still rights between them that have not been resolved. So Allah says to them, wait there, everybody pass and they're waiting. Until Allah settles the affairs between them. They're not going to go to hellfire, but they work it out. Because nobody enters paradise with any grudge in their heart. So eventually it will work out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there for us. But we have to have mercy between each other. Yeah. Now, I better stop before I go into another lecture. <laughs> That's it? Ya Allah. Go, ya akhi. <laughs> Brother is asking a good question. If you've committed a sin in the past, do you have to keep repenting for the rest of your life for that one sin? No, just once. Just once. Sahih in the Quran. Say to the ones who have disbelieved that Allah disbelieved and converted and, you know, and, and believed and repented that Allah forgives everything that has come, gone past. Just once you have to. You can say, Oh Allah, forgive me for all my past sins. And I come to you in repentance, Allah will forgive you. Once. No, no, no. What's better in sujood or raising? It doesn't matter. The one where your heart is into it, the one where you mean. You can just be standing up and walking on the footpath or driving in your car and you remember. Astaghfirullah al azim. But it comes out from your heart. Sometimes you're in sujood but you're not feeling it. In your car was better. Isn't that right? It happens to me sometimes. It doesn't happen to you. Driving and then suddenly my memory takes me back 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Ah, I said this to someone. Oh, astaghfirullah al -azim. Listening maybe to a lecture in my car. A sheikh is talking about or a da'a is talking about something that reminded me of something that I had done in the past. I say, astaghfirullah al -azim. May Allah forgive me. Of course. All the time. This is beautiful, ikhwan. This is beautiful. Tawbah is worship. Repentance is worship. It's beautiful. This is beautiful. A person who does that all the time, Allah, they are righteous, insha'Allah. That's a sign of righteousness. Okay, ya ikhwan. Remember the hadith we said in the beginning? If you went to sin and then repent, Allah would have perished you and created another creature that would sin and repent. Remember that? Nah, that's the hope, insha'Allah ta'ala. والله غفور الرحيم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته